right. Hi, everybody. Very happy to be here. It's quite impressive uh, to have a, a full room in front of me. Um, I'm very happy as well to talk about Kafka uh, in the cinema because every time I go to the, to the cinema with my wife, she absolutely doesn't want me to talk about Kafka. So today I have one hour with you, 15 mi 50 minutes, and I'm going to enjoy this time. Myself, uh, Stefan, I'm French, I, as you can guess, uh, I'm a Kafka geek. I've been working with Kafka for like a decade at least, Kafka 07 uh, for the old people uh, working with Kafka as well. Uh, I co-founded a company called Conductor. I'm going to have a few words about it in, a one, in one slide. Uh, you can connect on me with me on LinkedIn, on uh, Slack, on wherever you want. I will be uh, happy to answer to anything. Very, very quickly, uh, Conductor, some of you might know, uh, might know us. We are basically a data platform specialized on streaming data. So streaming uh, means Kafka here. Uh, we provide a beautiful interface, I would say, uh, that you can see on the screen. Uh, and we provide a proxy, so a Kafka proxy. Uh, and everything combined, basically, we help a large organization to deal with data security. Uh, with compliance, with self-serve, like to, to manage teams together, uh, with SQL on Kafka, with automation, audit, uh, failover, data quality, blah, blah, blah. It's a long, long list. Just uh, take a look uh, and it's free to get started. Apache Kafka, raise your hand who has work with Apache Kafka, send messages, consume data, to do something with Kafka. Okay, so a large major majority. I hope you enjoy it because I'm going to talk about many, many things that go wrong, obviously, with Kafka. Uh, I was just talking with someone minutes ago to say, hey, you never worked with Kafka. Uh, you are going to enjoy a lot of things or not. And the note is actually coming. We are not going to discuss about all of this. This is a slide I keep like for, it's been five, seven years. I keep this slide uh, with me, but it's just a small numbers of uh, concept of Apache Kafka itself. Uh, it's already a long list. Some of them we could take, uh, we could take one hour to actually explain them. Uh, and I'm not even talking about the ecosystem itself. If you know Kafka, you know like Kafka Streams, Kafka Connect. SQL DB, schema registry, blah, blah, blah. So uh, Kafka is a beautiful piece of technology, but it's very, 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 very complex. And even after, after 10 years, it's still hard uh, to actually get the things right and to know exactly what is causing some kind of issues or something. I'm going to present a lot of issues and uh, a lot of solutions as well. Networking 101 lesson. Is this, all these things are true, do you think? Network is reliable, latency is zero. There is no cost, obviously. You have one administrator in your company to deal with network. This is entirely wrong. And this is what we call uh, the fallacies of distributed computing. So you can go on uh, Wikipedia, for instance. It's a lot of fun uh, because all the distributed systems, basically, they have to deal with these things. That Every single uh, thing here is just wrong, meaning the network is entirely unreliable. Uh, the latency is not zero like at all. The topology, the networking topology keeps changing over time uh, in organization. It's complex and it's complex. And Kafka, you know what? Kafka is a distributed system. Uh, so it's a system that basically can scale horizontally. You just add more machine, let's say, or virtual machine, something. Uh, and then you have a lot of clients connected to uh, Kafka itself. So the clients can produce data or a client can consume data. Or the, the a client can just do uh, both of them at the same time, uh, but it's, it, it's similar. So in a distributed system, uh, where could things go wrong, especially in Kafka? The answer is everywhere, obviously. Uh, but here with Kafka, everything comes down to the client. Uh, your Kafka today, in 2024, Kafka, the servers, the brokers, the clusters are quite good. Uh, your Kafka provider, you know, Confluent, Red Panda, AWS, uh, StreamZ on Red Hat, it's perfect. They are working well. All the issues are typically 99% on the client side, meaning on the application side. This is what I see at Conductor. This is what I see at Confluent. Everything is on the client side. 
And you know what? Who is dealing with the client side in an organization? Developers. So developers are like, oh, fuck, it's me actually that has to deal with this thing. And all the concept I presented before, as a developer working with Kafka, you somehow are going to be challenged by this concept. You are going to say, oh my god, there is a in-seek replica. What does it mean? What, what the hell is that? And you will need to actually be able to get what it means to fix some kind of issue. If you raise like a ticket uh, to your Kafka provider, I can tell you they are going to say, send me the logs of your application. What is the configuration of your application? Did, what did you try? And everything will be just on the application side and not at all on the Kafka provider side. So this talk is actually more like this. I'm just going to talk about applications today, so the client side. I'm not going to talk about all the things uh, on the broker side, because today not a lot of people, not a lot of teams are actually managing Kafka themselves. You generally go to a provider that can basically offload this from you, because it's, it's another job, let's say. So quick, quick recap uh, about Kafka. You know, it's a, an Apache project, uh, so it's free to use and, and to get started. Small news, uh, if you did not know, Kafka is now compiled with CrawlVM. So it's very cool because it boots uh, really, really fast. Like you just type the command, it's already started very, very fast. Uh, and if you use like test containers to do, you know, Kafka testing, just uh, switch to this image as uh, this container and things are going just to be faster because if you know Gravel, uh, basically use less memory, it just goes faster, and so on and so on. I started in uh, tw 2015, so you, know, you see the small arrow. Uh, for me, it's like trading. I was, oh, Kafka is amazing already. I already can do everything I want. So far, so good. I did not get the impression that actually I was at the beginning of something uh, actually massive that, as you can see on, on the graph, Kafka kept improving, 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 and actually more commits, more commits, more commits. Kafka streams, Kafka Connect, KSQL DB, blah, blah, blah. It's just expanding. Uh, it's usable in all the languages, whatever you are using. You probably can send data uh, to Kafka anyway. And this is actually a, a pain that we are going to see. All these clients have differences, discrepancies, and actually uh, they alter how you co contact Kafka and what are basically the, 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 the some rules and some issues. So first thing, you know the two problems in IT, well, at least the, there are two problems in IT. The first one is cache invalidation. The second one is naming things. Kafka, it's exactly this. Because contrary to when you code something, you have yet to, to name your, var your variables. But with Kafka, Kafka is something you install in an organization. And you push basically data to, to your organization. It means that then everyone in your org will see the names that you are using in Kafka, the name of your data. You cannot put foobar because like, what, what is foobar? It makes no sense. So this is typically the first problem that an organization has, is they do not absolutely not put some kind of terminology of like nomenclature to be sure that in an organization large, I know exactly what this data is. I know exactly who owns this data. Um, so like if you work with Kafka, you might recognize the first thing, who created this topic, final, final topic, arrow, whatever, in production. It happens. It happens a lot. It always, uh, it's always happening if you don't protect yourself uh, from this kind of behaviors. First thing, the do, if you want, is really define a convention. Wh whoever in your, organization, in your organization is managing Kafka, they, sh put, they should have some kind of uh, convention that everyone in the business should use to be sure that things are clean from the start. Because with Kafka, you cannot rename topics, for instance. So if you, pick a, if you choose a name at the beginning, you are going to keep this name for 10 years in front of you. Uh, so you might not be happy with that. And the second thing, even, even if you have cool namings, good namings, you always need to define a kind of ownership on your data, on your topics. Like in SQL, you, in, you use Snowflake, Databricks, whatever. You probably have someone who you can talk to about this data and you know instantly who owns this data. So in Kafka, this is the same thing. Uh, and this is the kind of thing you have to resolve with some kind of self-serve approach. So self-serve means every team Basically, they own their data. They have to declare the ownership of their data. 
through CI/CD. I'm going to show something just after, but they own the data. The data is not owned by people managing Kafka. They absolutely do not care. Uh, every ops, if you, we have ops in the org, you probably have no idea what are the data uh, inside Kafka because you are not talking too much to the product teams, to the people actually sending the thing, and it's normal. It's not the same role. Two tips about that when you declare uh, some kind of convention. Uh, it's always used as a large scope first, and then you go down. So the smaller scope uh, scopes after, like env dash domain, dav, uh, the data name, uh, dash, uh, for instance, the version. Um, Kafka is not just about data, so topics. Uh, if you have worked a bit with Kafka, you know that you have consumer groups. Consumer groups, they also have some kind of naming associated, like the group ID. It has to follow something. It has to follow some uh, the same, more or less, uh, convention. Same for group instance ID. Same for client ID. This is what the name that appears in the logs. Same for the headers of Kafka. When you send data to Kafka, you can associate some headers, key value. You need very, very often to have some convention on this. So it, Kafka is basically uh, makes this problem uh, very big because of all the, the naming uh, you have to use. This is a global, simple picture, very generic. Uh, what I would say uh, is, is a really good practice and what I see basically on the field. On the left, uh, you have all the teams, so uh, payment teams, clickstream, whatever. They own their data, they own their topic. They have to be uh, the owner of the data and they have to declare it like my team in my GitHub. This is the data, the resources that I own. At the bottom, you have the platform team. So the platform team is the team managing Kafka, basically, and the one who is defining the convention. And they say, OK, my policies in my business, this is how I want people to use uh, Kafka. I want them to use this fixed name. And then, and then uh, when the team is going to change their GitHub, you are going to have a reconciliation loop. Uh, so the CI-CD loop is going to validate that the application teams sh are actually using uh, the policies of the defined by the platform team. And if yes, then someone can approve the PR. And if the PR is approved, then uh, resources, the resources is created uh, inside Kafka. To do this, you can do buy, uh, buy it or build it. Uh, it's just going to be the same. Next uh, point. Very, when you use Kafka, you know that you have to replicate the data. It's a distributed system, so you don't want to lose data with Kafka, so you replicate the data. Uh, from a high level perspective, uh, you have, let's say, you have replicated your data uh, three times. This is very uh, what you should use, uh, not two, but at least three. And just few companies out there are using like four and five, like I think Apple, Apple and Microsoft are going to this range, but three is definitely the good answer. What happens today with Kafka if you lose two brokers, so two servers are done, like two zones are, are done, you can still with Kafka produce and consume data with the last broker. Okay, so this is one of the advantages. Uh, like if you're rolling upgrade Kafka, if you restart Kafka, you always are going to be in a situation uh, when some workers are going to be down. But hopefully, uh, Kafka is repli uh, replicates data, so you, you don't have any issue. But, uh, okay, I won't go there. Okay, I will talk about something with replication just after. Uh, a small trick that I learned uh, not a long time ago, to be honest, even if I have a decade of Kafka behind me, uh, it does not seem natural, but always pick a partition number, a uh, multiple of six. If you look at this Excel, so it's a small ugly. Uh, basically, you have the partition uh, numbers uh, in Y and uh, the number of consumers consuming so your, your, your topic. And if you always put a multiple of six, you have way more probability to always have a balanced situation for one consumer group. Like if I take the line 12, okay, 18, 18 is better, 18 partitions. If I have one consumer, it is consuming uh, 18 partitions, obviously. If I have two consumers, it is consuming nine partitions divided by two. If I have three, uh, six partitions divided by uh, three. Uh, if I have six, three. Uh, Three, uh, six times three. Um, and when you, you look, the, the highest numbers of, of, of actually of balance situation 
it's always when it's a multiple of 6. I'm not inventing it, it's just there, 6, 12, 18, uh, 24, and so on. So always try to pick a partition of 6 without thinking too much. Uh, this way you are not going to have unbalanced uh, situations. Very quickly, this one, uh, it's sometimes it's hard to, to know how many partitions you have to create. This is a question that has no proper answer uh, we, in the Kafka world. One trick is to know, uh, basically, what is the global throughput you are expecting in your topics. Like, I don't know, you have some events from uh, customers, they are sending events to your Kafka. You know that you may expect 100 megabytes, okay, overall, globally. Okay, cool. No, you can actually test your infrastructure, your Kafka infrastructure, using like Kafka producer uh, path test to know one partition, how much can it handle. Okay, you just do this test, can, how much can it handle? If the answer is, for instance, 20 megabytes per second, it depends on so many things. Huh? It depends on your networking, the IOs, your number of CPUs, the batching strategy, blah, blah, blah. It's a long story. So you just do a benchmark, you have a clear answer. You do the same on the consumer side. So as a consumer, how, how much can I consume uh, just on one partition? For instance, here is 25 megabytes per second because the processing uh, as, as a consumer can go fast. And then you apply this small formula and it's going to give you a number. It's going to give you a number that wh whatever the, path, the producer is actually the slower, the slower one or the consumer, you are going to have the max of it and then you, be, you are going to be sure that you can sustain actually the maximum throughput uh, that you, you are expecting. And then you put actually six because of what we just said before. So this is just a really quick trick uh, to have a better answer about the number of partitions. This one is massive. Uh, in organization, you could say everybody is always up to date. You know, as a developer, you always up, up, up put uh, your Spring or your whatever up to date. Uh, it's one of the major re reasons uh, in the ecosystem that you have issues actually on the customer side uh, because nobody is basically upgrading their version. Uh, so you know, the, ver the, the default are changing. Uh, before Kafka 3, they were quite bad. They were not uh, very safe, I would say. After Kafka 3, the defaults are better. So if you are, your Kafka client is not uh, even at the 3.0 version, uh, really uh, uh, upgrade it. And if you actually use the latest version, you have a bunch of new features that keep making your client more uh, resilient, less data that, that, that loss, uh, more compression to have better throughput, and so on and so on. So really consider to always upgrade. And if you care about security, just look at the small uh, table on the bottom right. It's all the CVs uh, in the old Kafka versions, old Kafka client version, meaning that if you have one of these versions, you have vulnerabilities in your application today. So definitely uh, try to upgrade. Very small example, this is something, this thing, if you go on Google Kafka Option Explorer, this is just a matrix to see all the flags, all the configuration of all Kafka, by uh, by versions, so you can know more or less uh, when this new flag, for instance, is available. It's quite handy. Okay, so now even even if you have you know the latest version of uh, your Kafka client, very cool. Uh, the default are quite bad still uh, for most use cases. Uh, the default are the thing on the top, linger to zero, comp no compression, and a very very small batch size. Uh, when you use this configuration, you are probably uh, doing a lot of networking hops. Basically, you are sending small chunks of data, you are waiting small chunk of data, and so on and so on. Typically, we, we re recommend to actually use the bottom uh, left part is, first of all, it's always tune your batch size because it's way too small generally. Batch size means if one, one piece of data is like five kilobytes for you, like a JSON, five kilobytes, in a batch today, you can send three records max. So you are opening a connection just to send three pieces of data, three records. If you just upgrade to 200 kilobytes, for instance, you are going to send way more data actually uh, uh, in one shot. And so you are way more efficient uh, on the networking side. And basically, you will have a way, way, way better uh, throughput. Um, I will talk about the bottom uh, right part. This one is very important and can be fun 
for the developers, but not for the ops, uh, fetch, fetch min byte, uh, the default is one. So it means that as a client, when I contact Kafka, I say, as soon as you have one byte of data, just one byte, send me the answer. I want data right now. You can upgrade, you can increase it. You can say one megabyte. Just, I, w I will wait for one megabyte of data. Okay, cool. If you put zero, zero means I, Kafka don't even wait, send me a, a response right now. Right now, if you have data or you don't have data, send me something. When you do that, your client is going to, to reach Kafka. Kafka is going to say, oh, I have nothing, and it's zero, so I will answer directly. The client will say, okay, and it will, will try. And back and forth, back and forth at the speed of your network. If you do this on your Mac, I have a M1, my CPU uh, reach uh, 13, uh, 30, 30%, 30 30, zero, doing absolutely nothing. So today, if you do that on production, you may basically kill your Kafka cluster uh, as a client, okay? Dangerous, very dangerous. Compression, okay, this one, it should be quite obvious. Everything you want to send on the network should be always compressed uh, on the networking side. Uh, Kafka compress uh, batches. So basically you have a lot of records. It's a batch for Kafka and it just compress a full batch. Meaning that if a batch is like uh, a full of JSON, JSON records, you know that JSON basically it's more or less always the same structure. Your compression rate will be amazing. You will send just a few chunks of data, of bytes, because of this uh, great compression. And if you go further, you can actually use uh, uh, the format ZSTD, so Z standard, uh, I think it's from Facebook. Uh, very, very recently, Kafka 3.8, there is a, so a new kip. Uh, you can just doing adding one flag, the, Z, uh, the ZSTD dot level dot uh, one, I think. Uh, you are going to have a better throughput and you are going to have lower latency. Just adding one flag, it change everything. Uh, so this is very fresh and this is why you should always be up to date and why you should always try to compress your data because it's just giving love to the network because you have less, basically, uh, things to send across the network, and you are going to store less data on the Kafka side. Don't forget that Kafka stores the data, so someone has to pay for the storage. Uh, so the, uh, the smaller it is, the, the better. OK, a few flags uh, globally. Axe, so Kafka is a distributed system again. When you send data, you have to wait for Kafka to say, OK, I got your data, and you want to say, I got your data, and I have replicated your data. Because if you just, uh, the first situation, x equal 1, means Kafka, do you have my data? You will say, yes, OK. But if your, your Kafka dies a second after, your data may be lost, lo lose forever. So this is not what something is that you want. The default is no x all, meaning you send your data to one server, one broker, it's going to replicate the data. It's going to come back to you when it is replicated. And now you are safe. Your data cannot be lose, or more or less. Uh, and so this is basically the default. So don't think uh, it's always ax all. This one is a bit tricky. Um, when you replicate the data, you know the bottom schema here, diagram, uh, you have basically two replicas. What happens if you, are, you have ax all? But actually, the two replicas are dead because something happened, uh, they had a failure. Kafka, if you don't send, send, set the things right, Kafka is still going to tell you, to your client, hey, your data, I got your data, you're cool, even if the data are not replicated, which is actually a massive danger because no, there is still one just broker having the data, the last one, so if it dies, data uh, are, are lost. So there is this new flag, uh, min in sync replica. You set it to two, so replication factor three, min in sync replica two. It means that no, Kafka is not going to accept your data because it cannot replicate it at least uh, twice. Okay, so it's going to say to the producer, I'm sorry, uh, I, I don't have enough uh, colleagues to replicate the data. If I accept your data, I may lose them, so I refuse your data. And so now the, 
the, the, the thing is on the client side, on the producer, the producer is going to retry. Because maybe, eventually, a new broker will pop up, will connect, and will be able to accept uh, the, the new replication. Just be aware that Kafka retries this kind of things for two minutes. Only two minutes. So if you have a broker uh, broker's done for two minutes, it will retry for two minutes. After two minutes, your Kafka, your client, your application, your producer is just going to crash. And what do you do when it happens? Good luck, because you, just, uh, you are just losing your data in your application, in your producer memory. And, and so, yeah, not fun. Typically, you, you can consider to increase this delivery timeout, like 10 minutes, one hour, two hours. This way, you give way more time uh, to the process to come back. Um, idem potence, okay, massive topic. I hope everybody knows more or less idem potence is when you retry the same action multiple times, the, the outcome is always the same, okay? With Kafka, this is quite important because it's, again, a distributed system. Uh, if you look at the top lane, the good request, global uh, nominal scenario, I want to produce data, Kafka accepts it, and uh, he acts that I got your data, okay. Let's look at the, the, the next lane. No, I produce data to Kafka, cool. He saves it, it's, it, it stores it locally, but network happened, and the networking lose basically the, the acknowledgement. It, it really can happen. So as a producer, I did not get the hack. I said, I did not get anything, so I'm going to retry. But he's going to send the same data, basically. And hopefully, when you enable this flag, enable uh, item patterns, through, Kafka is going to detect that, but I already see this, so this thing, I, I don't want it. It's just going silently to say, uh, I already got it, and send you the hack. So as a producer, you don't even see that you have tried to publish twice the same piece of data. This is quite important. This is the default, uh, hopefully, in Kafka now. But massive trick here, it's only on the producer side, so when you are producing data. Let's look at the other side, when I'm consuming data. So there is a topic, I'm consuming uh, this topic, but I have three instances of my application, okay? My consumer group, basically, I have three instances. They are consuming different partitions, so far, so good. I have one instance that dies, because Kubernetes, because something happened. The partitions, of this instance are going to be redistributed to the other partitions, uh, the other instances. The other instances are going to consume the same partitions and they are going to restart where, not where it failed, but before, on the last commit, basically, for the consumer group that did not have time to commit because it just crashed. So now your A and B are going to consume the same data and you, it can be a massive uh, danger because if you reprocess the same data, you are going to basically do the same side effect, like sending an email out there, doing something, uh, removing uh, money from your customer. So all your consumers' instances, they have to be aware and they have to have some kind of shared state where they know exactly what has already been processed or not. Okay, this is, this is really something that uh, happens easily and it's not the fault of Kafka. It's just uh, software engineering here. <coughs> uh, schema registry. Uh, if you use Kafka, you may know this piece. A small recap about Kafka. Kafka is just just knows bytes. Okay, he has no idea what is an integer, what is a string, what is whatever. He just knows bytes. This is why it's very efficient. So when you send data to Kafka, you want to send a string, but behind the scene, in your client code, in your producer, you are actually you have some kind of transformer, what we call a serializer, to actually transform this data to bytes. And so you just send bytes uh, to Kafka. And when you consume data from Kafka, it's the other way around. As a consumer, I have to say, okay, I'm going to read this topic. This is actually the, the shape of the data. I'm going to use a deserializer to say, okay, I don't want bytes, I don't care. As an application, I want my string, I want my integer back. And so this is the, this no notion of serializer, deserializer. Why this is important is when you have complex data, 
So a string is not complex, but when you have fields, when you have uh, enums, when you have maps, something, you probably want to use some kind of uh, schema to define actually the representation of your data. So JSON, YOLO, there is no schema uh, on Joy. Today, there, is, there are two formats, basically, uh, Apache Avro and Protobuf. Uh, Apache Avro is really 95% of the use case, so here you may use Caf uh, Avro already. And Protobuf is just a short version of Avro, uh, but all the fields are optional, so yeah, it's a bit weird. So Avro, typically, it's a good choice. The whole ecosystem is uh, compatible uh, with that. And this is where the schema registry uh, enters. It's the basically just a simple database and an API to store all the schemas in your company, in your organization. So all the data formats, all the data schemas are in this schema re registry. And this is how, as a producer, I'm sending data to Kafka, some piece of data using the Avro uh, specification. But Kafka knows only bytes. And then when I'm going to consume these bytes, I need to know what is actually the shape of this data. And to do this, the consumer is actually going to request to the schema registry, hey, what is the shape actually of this data for this topic? And with this in hand, it's going to basically associate the schema to the bytes, and then it's going to be able to have like a real uh, POJO, for instance, in Java, a real object that uh, you can uh, work uh, in your application. And the, <coughs> the second part of it is uh, the schema registry, really important, is can ensure that you are not breaking uh, the compatibility of your schemas. For instance, if I'm, pro I, I'm producing data, uh, I'm producing a string somewhere, uh, I, I have a field, my consumers will depend on this field. So no, it is forbidden to remove this field as a producer. Because if I were to remove this field, my consumer will just crash all, all, all of them. So the schema registry can basically prevent you to do a massive mistake uh, by removing a field or some other uh, things like this. This is really, really ubiquitous in the Kafka ecosystem. Uh, so uh, use it from day one. Uh, don't try to use JSON. This is a massive headache at scale. Uh, data quality and issues. So Kafka, obviously, whatever I, I said before, you always have things that can come in, in, in the game. Uh, one of them is when you have application, someone, there is a bug, obviously, uh, and some data are sent into Kafka, but not the right format, so like this hello world in this case. Today, what happens uh, in your Kafka client, so in your consumer, we are looking at consumers here, they are going to probably throw an exception because they did not expect you know, this kind of shape. Uh, very often, they are going to crash because an under exception, what do I do? I crash, fail fast. You are probably on Kubernetes. Kubernetes is going to say, oh, it has crashed. I'm going to restart the application. You are going to do exact, the exact same thing the next time, the next next time, the next next time, uh, forever. This is really happening uh, in production, so unfortunately. One way <coughs> to fix it, uh, if you have alerting, because you need to be aware that your application is uh, failing on a loop, uh, you can use Kafka to actually say, oh, uh, skip this message, this record is really bad, just skip it, skip it, go to the next record, uh, because I, I cannot process this data. So you use a third party tooling, you use something, but it's something that you can do, and uh, very often support engineers are aware of this kind of manipulation uh, to be able to unlock uh, applications. One thing that we are all culprit of it, uh, it's to log, okay? I catch an exception, I log something, I move on, okay? It might work, it's cool, but let's be honest, who is uh, looking at the logs? Probably not a lot of people. Uh, who is looking at Datadog or you know Loki, whatever, this kind of thing? Probably not a lot of people. Uh, I don't. And you have something, another issue, if you, are, uh, if you do event streaming architecture, like uh, uh, you are sending events basically for one entity in your Kafka, you are going to have ordering issue. Because you are going to 
ignore some records and you are going to process the next things uh, in the line, in the topics, you may have massive business discrepancy because you are not processing basically all the events uh, coming in, into the pipe. The, the best pattern here is uh, dead letter queues. I think everybody is aware of uh, DLQ or in the Kafka world, DLT as the Spring calls them as well. It's basically to say, okay, I got data that I cannot process. So instead of just logging something, I actually send the data to a dedicated topic, a DLT here, dead letter topic, that someone somehow will be able to interpret and to fix the issue. Because someone has sent bad data in this topic, there is probably a fix to be done somewhere. And so by keeping actually this context, what is happening, what happened, you can have someone actually to look into it uh, and fix it. But, again, a rest but here. Uh, on the left, this is a typical Kafka record. So you have a partition offset, a timestamp, you have some headers, and you have uh, the data. You have, when you send data to, to, to a DLT, a DLQ, uh, one thing to not forget like at all is to send uh, the context of the original message. Because if you, are not, if you are not careful, you are going to create a new record in your DLQ, but you are not going to, to keep actually the existing, the previous state of the record. So you just have to copy paste them. You see my mouse? Yeah. You have just to copy basically the partition offset timestamp into headers of the new uh, records that you are sending to the DLQ. Uh, and the reason, if a record you are sending a record into a DLQ, you have a reason, probably. And so you have to put this reason into your DLQ as well. This way, someone, when they are going to look at uh, the DLQ, they will know exactly why this data is here and they will be able uh, to do something. Is this a technical uh, mistake? Is this a business rule that unexpectedly uh, had uh, an issue? Uh, something like this. In, in Spring, this is how you do it. So really, it's just a few lines of code. Uh, you basically define a dead letter publishing recoverer. Uh, and at the bottom, you can see that uh, I'm basically copying the metadata of the, the record that was at fault. I put them into the, the, the record I'm sending uh, to the new uh, DLQ, uh, to the DLQ, sorry. All right, this one. This one, I love it so much. Uh, it's something that I, you don't see coming. And I saw so, so many mistakes on the field because of this. So Java, Java, lib Kafka is typically a library you are using. So it's a C library, C, C++. But uh, Python is relying on it, uh, Node.js is relying on it, uh, sometimes I think Rust can rely on it. Uh, some libraries are all relying on it. And they are all doing something wrong, which is not following actually what the Java side is doing. And uh, this is leading to a headache. In Java, when you are sending data to, to Kafka and you have a key, basically this is a function used to determine basically in which partition uh, this data is going to be sent. So it is just more or less doing a murmur2, which is a hashing algorithm, on your key. Okay, so far, so good. In Libardi Kafka, not the same, like at all. It is using another function, CRC32. Uh, it means that for the same string, devox here, Java is going to tell me, oh, the partition for devox is two. Liberty Kafka in Python, for instance, is going to say, oh, the partition for DevOps is one. Uh, but if Kafka is the same key, you know that should always go into the same partition. If you are using two languages like here, like this, you are going to have your key in two partitions. And it's going to be very complicated to troubleshoot because these kind of things are lost uh, in, in an ecosystem. If basically you have two producers of data to the same topic using not the same language, boom. Hopefully you can fix it, but it's not the default. I don't know why, uh, but you can fix it by setting in uh, your uh, Liberty Kafka program, your Python, Rust, whatever, uh, partitioner equal murmur2 to say, I want the same behavior uh, than Java. 
Okay, this is uh, something uh, you really have to know. Um, Kafka has keys, so the records in Kafka, they have keys, a key and a value. Uh, never use something else than a string or an integral, I would say, uh, with Kafka as keys. I only saw problems with that. Uh, first, uh, if you are using like protobuf or uh, yeah, JSON schemas, so with a schema registry behind, know that they are not deterministic by default. So the same piece of data when it is serialized into binary data, may not be the same. This is a bit crazy, but the spec does not say it has to be deterministic. And so the implementation is not deterministic, meaning that because it's not the same bytes in the end, you can send the same piece of data into two different partitions, even if actually it's the same piece of data, because the bytes uh, will be different. In Java and I think go, uh, the protobuf has this function, set deterministic basically true, to be sure that uh, in the end it's uh, the same thing. Uh, second part is a key should never evolve. A key should be stable for a decade because you don't want to change the partition uh, of your key. If my, for devox, if uh, the partition of devox, the string was one, it should stay one forever. A schema is meant to evolve. If you have a schema, it's because you are going to add fields, you are going to remove fields, you are going to do something. It's totally, it's contrary to actually the keys, because the keys, you absolutely do not want them to evolve. So you don't need more or less a schema. And so this is why uh, keep a string or an integer, uh, because you are going to, to make your life way, way easier uh, instead of having uh, a schema. This one may be my favorite because I had to work a lot on this uh, in the past. Um, today, let's say you have this service, you know it's a microservice. Uh, you have customers, users, they, they post on your service and they get the thing on your service and you have a Postgres, so far so good. Uh, when they send data to your microservice, they can instantly get read what they just wrote. It's, it, it makes sense, but it's not so easy sometimes. This is what we call a uh, read after write consistency. Then uh, your business comes, well, your business, the tech business of your company comes, they say, okay, we want to use Kafka in the business now because we want like to streamline how we move data in my organi in our organization. We want to make to get more value from our data, something like this. All the teams now are going to say, okay, we need to publish our data to Kafka as well. It, it looks it looks easy in appearance, but how are you going to do it? So I, 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 as a developer, okay, I already have my code to write into my local database, my Postgres, for instance. Should I just add uh, like Kafka producer send something and to say, okay, I commit to my database and then I send data to Kafka? No, because your program can just stop in the middle just between the commit and before uh, you are sending data to Kafka. Or Kafka might just fail and uh, you, the data never reached Kafka actually. So you wrote into your database, but maybe not in Kafka. If you try the other way around, you try to produce data to Kafka and then you commit uh, your transaction into Postgres. Yes, but no, because if your transaction is not right, if your Postgres refused your transaction, you have sent data to Kafka. So someone else in the ecosystem is going to read your data in Kafka, but they do not exist in your database. So not a good solution. And then you will see, oh, I know Kafka has transactions. So you will make basically two transactions, one for Kafka, one for Postgres, and try to mix them to commit at the same time and to abort at the same time. Looks like a good idea, but not at all, because Kafka and Postgres are not sharing uh, any transa common transaction context, so, so they are not at all aware of each other. So one is going to be committed, while the other can actually be rolled back. Again, inconsistencies. Today, there is no way to do this, just no way. You cannot write into two systems uh, when one is Kafka at the same time, except if it's Kafka and Kafka. It's going to change uh, with uh, the KIP 9939 uh, with the 2PC. So 2PC, uh, I forgot already, prepare uh, something, prepare commit. Uh, no, forgot. Uh, to Kafka. And 
yeah, two phase commit, thank you. Uh, and then you are going to write actually to your database and Kafka with a common uh, context, uh, transactional context, but uh, at least next year or next next year. Today, when you need to do this, so in your organization, in your service, uh, you can use something called Debezium. Uh, so it's Kafka Connect. It's just a plugin on Kafka Connect. More or less, Debezium is going to listen to your database, to Postgres here. It's going to listen to the wall, the right log, uh, if you know. Uh, and every modification on Postgres, any create, any update, Debezium is going to listen to this and it's going to send this data, this new data in, the, in your tables to Kafka. So instead of actually do a dual write, you are doing a sequential uh, write. First Postgres and then Kafka using Debezium that will make sure that uh, the two data sources are actually consistent. There is a small trick if you are already using uh, this kind of systems. Look at this uh, parameter wall writer delay at uh, 10 millis because on Postgres by default it's two, 200 millis. So it takes at least 200 millis uh, at most to actually send data from your Postgres to Kafka. In my use case, it was way too long, impossible, and you have actually this setting uh, to make it uh, just at 10 millis, which is way better. <coughs> Event-driven architecture, uh, it's this principle where you send, you have entities in your business like customer order, customer order, these kind of things, and you want in Kafka to always uh, use the same key and to basically have multiple events for the same entity. For instance, here I have order created, I have order shipped, okay? One thing when you do this, you should always, always use one topic only for these kind of things. If you don't, if you think it's a good idea to have one topic per event on the same uh, entity, it's going to be fine when you are going to produce data. It's going to be terribly wrong on the consumer side. When you consume data with Kafka, multiple topics here, it's not because uh, you sent the data into Kafka with the right time, that when you are going to consume this, this data, it's go they are going to follow the same time. Kafka works by batch, so it's going to send a lot of the first, a lot of data from the first topic, and then a lot of data from the second topic. Meaning, you may be able to have like uh, order shipped for the order uh, four, five, four, five, six, and then order created after. So it makes absolutely no sense. Uh, you cannot ship something that is not even created uh, in this use case. And this is why you should always, always use only one topic, but multiple events in this topic, all of them together. This way, you can have a continuity, basically, uh, of your uh, entity, and you know exactly the life cycle when you are consuming this data. You are going to consume partition by partition, and you are going to find all the events for each uh, individual entity in this thing. Um, okay, I will go to this one instead. Uh, in Kafka, you can have you when you create topics, uh, you have two you have one configuration to say, okay, I want in I want this data to be expired after like two weeks. So I don't want more than two weeks of data in my Kafka. And you have the other way around is, I want to keep the last value for each key in Kafka. This is the compact mode. Retention. Uh, there is this user, uh, it's, a, it's a fresh blog from last, last week, something like this. They had an issue uh, uh, because their topic retention was two weeks, but after a few months, the topic was terabyte of data. And they say, how is this possible? Because my retention is just two weeks. He then discovers that Kafka, uh, when you send data to Kafka, as a producer, you are setting the time of the data as a producer. So I'm on machine, machine one. My time on my machine is going to define actually the date time of the record sent to Kafka. This person has a machine where actually the date was wrong, was in the future, was 2025 for some reason. 
And so in is topic, the data were updated at uh, uh, 2025. Obviously, Kafka, when it tries to run his uh, algorithm to clean data, says, oh, but it's data from 20, 2025. We are still in 2024. There is nothing to clean. And basically, his topic just grew, grew, grew until his Kafka was dead. So be aware uh, of this. OK, last, uh, last slide. Uh, it's a piece of advice. I'm not a Kafka provider myself, so totally independent here. Never try to manage Kafka yourself. Uh, Kafka is a pain, pain to manage. Uh, it's very complicated. We could have so many talks about how to manage Kafka. You have so many players, uh, the small list on the right. Every month, I think, I find a new Kafka provider out there. You know, someone providing Kafka as a service. So definitely try to rely on one and focus uh, on the application side because it's uh, way, way easier. And as you saw, we have already uh, many, many things on the client side. And I think I'm done. Thank you. It was a lot of things, I know, but I hope you learned something. Genesis.